Hello everyone, I am Anurag Khanna. I am currently a resident at the Emory University Hospital at the time of shooting this video. I am starting this channel to talk about interesting topics in pathology. I will be doing a, a fellowship in hematopathology so most of my content will be hemopath heavy and I am sorry for that and I am not really sorry for that because I actually love hemopath. I've always loved, you know, learning through audiovisual content and I've always wanted to teach and I've always liked teaching whenever I have gotten the opportunity to teach. And the best teachers that I have learned from, they have somehow, find, somehow found a way to combine their teaching skills with audiovisual uh, and other forms of content just to make it more interesting for their students and just to maintain the concentration of their students. So I will be attempting to do the same and I hopefully I can do the same. So let's uh, start with the process. So we are going to talk about B cell maturation. So first of all, let's go to where it all starts. This is the bone marrow. It, this is where all of it starts. All the blood cells start in the bone marrow and let's go deeper down into the bone marrow and come to the first cell that we are talking about that's called the hematopoietic stem cell. This cell right here gives rise to all the blood cells in the bone marrow. This hematopoietic stem cell can give rise to all the blood cells in the bone marrow. It's incredible, right? The one cell to give rise them to give rise to them all and the one cell to rule them all. So this is the hematopoietic stem cell. Now the hematopoietic stem cell, in order to form the B cells, it needs to get converted into something called the pro-B cell. And for that, it needs certain transcription factors. These transcription factors include Pax5, EBF1 and E2A, which are essential for the hematopoietic stem cell to convert into something called as the pro-B cell. Now what are transcription factors? All right, let's just go back and just see so this is a DNA and this is open here because it is at this place it's gonna go undergo transcription to form RNA. So this process is called transcription. From the RNA it undergoes a process called translation. and this gives rise to proteins. So basically transcription factors are proteins that bind to different regions of the DNA that control the rate of transcription and can also control other aspects of transcription. So this, uh, these transcription factors that is Pax5, EBF1 and E2A are very essential for conversion of the pro B cell to the, uh, of the hematopoietic stem cell to something called the pro B cell. Now the pro B cell gets converted into pre B cell and this is the place where the V, D, J rearrangements happen. I know some of us will be getting nightmares from medical school, oh no V, D, J rearrangements, not that again and some of the medical students who have not heard about it, um, you'll be hearing about those things soon. So just to quickly recapitulate, so V stands for variable. D stands for diversity and J stands for joining. So these are different areas of gene in the heavy chain of the immunoglobulin and the light chain just contains the V that is the variable and the J that is the joining regions and these are only found in the light chain. And there are rearrangements that happen in these uh, VDJ and VJ genes to generate different uh, permutations and combinations to form antibodies with different specificity and um, different affinities and everything. And we don't really need to go into detail about that right now. So the pre B cell gets converted into something called the immature B cell. Now I'm sorry I don't have a picture for that. It's my first video and I guess you could cut me some slack on that. So next we, uh, so this immature B cell gets converted into something called the naive B cell. So this naive B cell, it is the first B cell that has the B cell receptor, that is the BCR, that is the B cell receptor. 
So what is the B cell receptor? It is basically immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin D that is IgM and IgD on the surface of the B cell which forms the B cell receptor. So now this naive B cell gets exposed to an antigen and it is naive. It's a child. It gets excited. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is a beautiful toy that I just got but I don't know what to do with it. Somebody please help me out and help me understand what to do with this toy. So it gets exposed to the antigen. It doesn't know what to do. So the only person who can help this naive B cell is the helper T cell but this helper T cell is sitting far away from the bone marrow in the lymph node in the T cell areas of the lymph node. Now how to get there? So this naive B cell talks to all the friends around tries asking everybody around in the bone marrow and one of his friends whispers in his ear and says you know what the T cell areas in the lymph node they have certain chemicals called CCL19 and CCL20. So only if you could regulate some, you know, upregulate something on your surface or you could just get it from somewhere that can just hold on to these chemicals, this will help you migrate to the T cell areas. So the naive B cell thinks about it a lot. Uh, and it comes up with an idea and says, Eureka, why don't I just upregulate CCR7? The CCR7 is the receptor for ligands CCL19 and CCL20. So this a uh, naive B cell upregulates CCR7 on its surface and this helps it migrate to the T cell areas of the lymph node. So once it reaches the T cell area of the lymph node, this naive B cell presents the helper T cells with the antigen that the new toy that it got with the help of a molecule called the MHC2 on its surface and the naive B cell says, oh mighty T cell, please help me with this. I don't know what to do with this antigen. The T helper cell uh, analyzes the antigen with the help of the T cell receptor with the CD40L and also uses other interleukins and says naive B cell. Now you have two options. Either you can start working right now and get early fame and get converted into something called the plasma cells and start secreting immunoglobulin M. But beware, you can only secrete immunoglobulin M as you have not undergone class switching yet and you will be short-lived. The other option naive B cell is to undergo more training and to undergo more processes that can happen in the lymph node follicle. But beware, this process is a long and complicated one and it is a very hard road to travel. So certain naive B cells, they choose the first part, that is they get converted into plasma cells and they only secrete immunoglobulin M because they have not undergone class switching yet. And these plasma cells are short-lived. Some of the other naive B cells, they go to the center of the lymphoid follicle and convert into something called the centroblast. These centroblasts start proliferating and form the germinal centers. So this here in this image that we are seeing, and we can zoom in further here, this is the germinal center. This, you can see that this germinal center has certain dark areas as you can see here and certain light areas. So these centroblasts, they occupy the dark areas of the germinal center. So let's just talk about the germinal center centroblast. They occupy the dark zone. They express low levels of surface immunoglobulin and they lack BCL2. This is very important because this BCL2 also comes up later uh, in other lymphomas like follicular lymphomas etc. So what is this BCL2? It is an anti-apoptotic factor. So if something lacks BCL2, it lacks an anti-apoptotic factor. So it will be highly susceptible to apoptosis. So now the centroblast, they have undergone some initial training, but they feel that they are still not ready yet and they want to do more fellowships. So they decide to do two fellowships and these two fellowships are called somatic hypermutation and class switch recombination. So what is somatic hypermutation? So remember that we had talked about the VDJ rearrangements and the other rearrangements that happen at the pre-B cell level. Now point mutations happen in these rearranged genes and this is called somatic hyper, hypermutation and what does it lead to? So because of this it improves the affinity of the antibody to the antigen. However since no process is perfect it can also lead to some mutations that are not good for the cell or sometimes they might start even recognizing the body's own antigen. So such cells are killed. Remember the T helper cell had said that this is a very hard and long process and he was right. The cell can even get killed if they undergo some unworthy mutations to say the least. 
The second fellowship that they undergo is called the class switch recombination. So what happens in this uh, class switch recombination that is they can now switch between classes. That is they can now secrete antibodies of different classes that is IgG, IgA and IgE. So because of these two fellowships or these two processes that the centroblast goes through, this allows the secretion of different classes of antibody with a high affinity to the antigen. So now this central, uh, so this, uh, so this is a very important thing because you can now secrete antibodies of different classes that is IgG, A, E and these antibodies will be of much higher affinity than what they could secrete before. So these then centroblast then differentiate into something called centrocytes. These centrocytes occupy the light zone. So again we have the same image here that is the germinal center. This is the dark zone here. These are the centroblasts, that is these are the bigger cells here and they move to the light zone, that is this is the light zone here and they form the centrocytes. So this is the area where the centrocytes reside. So now the centrocytes uh, have undergone initial training, they have undergone uh, two additional fellowships and now they have to undergo their final test and graduation. So they are presented with immune complexes from the follicular dendritic cells and the helper T cells and if they recognize the immune complexes with appropriate affinity and appropriately, the helper T cells give them pro-survival signals and they say, you are ready now, my son. You are now ready to exit the germinal center. So now, uh, after exiting the germinal center, some of these centrocytes or the B cells enter directly into active duty and they convert into plasma cells. And they can now secrete antibodies of different classes, remember, because of the class switching. And these antibodies have high affinity. So these plasma cells circulate in the peripheral blood and then ultimately home to the bone marrow. Some of the naive, uh, some of the centrocytes, after exiting the germinal center, they get converted into post-germinal center memory B cells. That is, they enter the reserve force of the immune system in our body so that subsequent attacks that happen by the similar antigen, we can mount a defense quickly and more effectively. So these uh, memory B cells circulate in the peripheral blood and they form the marginal zones of follicles in the lymph nodes, spleen and mucosal associated lymphoid tissue called the MOLD. Let's quickly just talk about briefly, I mean, about the molecular characteristics that happen in the pre-germinal center area and the germinal center and the post-germinal center. There are actually three masters. So these three masters are PAX5, BCL6 and BLIMP1. So PAX5 is very essential for the hematopoietic stem cell to convert into B cell lineage. BCL6 is called the master of the germinal center. This BCL6 inhibits MYC gene and BLIMP1 gene. So what does BLIMP1 do? Why does BCL6 have to inhibit BLIMP1? BLIMP1 is the master of the plasma cells. So a B, a B cell cannot convert into a plasma cell unless and until the BLIMP1 gets expressed. So the BCL6 does not want that the cells inside the germinal center be prematurely converted to plasma cells, so it inhibits BLIMP1. So then how does BLIMP1 get activated? Remember the last and the final step which happens, that is the centrocyte gets exposed to immune complex signals. If everything goes right here, this leads to activation of NF-kappa B pathway. This NF-kappa B activates IRF4. This IRF4 inhibits BCL6 and also activates BLIMP1. So now the cells are ready and they can get converted to plasma cells. So this is briefly in mole uh, the molecular things that happen at different levels during B cell maturation. So now you saw that this process is a very long and complex one. And as we know, if a process is long, has multiple steps, multiple things can go wrong at different levels. So let's just talk about the bad things that can happen and which parts of this B cell maturation process give rise to which lymphomas. So let's just go back to a bird's eye view and let's just go back to the beginning. Uh, so this 
was the step that we talked about the hematopoietic stem cell. So this is the precursor B cell and the precursor B cell gives rise to B lymphoblastic leukemia lymphoma. Then we go to the pre-germinal center B cells. That is before they go become centroblasts and they form the germinal center, the B cells there that they form the mantle cell lymphoma. The germinal center process as we have seen it is such a long process and multiple things happen in the germinal center so multiple things can go wrong. So germinal center neoplasm, follicular lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, DLBCL, some types of DLBCL because uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma or DLBCL can be germinal center type and activated B cell type. Some types of DLBCL can occur are germinal center type and then Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then post germinal center the post-germinal center neoplasms include marginal zone lymphoma, malt lymphoma, CLL that is chronic lymphocytic leukemia slash small lymphocytic lymphoma and certain types of DLBCL that is the activated B cell type, lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma and plasma cell myeloma. So just in summary we talked uh, about B cell maturation, how it starts in the bone marrow from the hematopoietic stem cell to the pre B cell, sorry to the pro B cell, pre B cell, immature B cell, naive B cell gets exposed to an antigen, goes to the T cell area of lymph nodes, then either gets converted to short lived plasma cells or goes inside the germinal center and converts to centroblast. Centroblast occupy the dark zone, uh, they lack BCL2, then centroblast undergo somatic hypermutation and class switching recombination which helps them to produce antibodies of different classes with the higher affinity to the antigen than before. Then they get converted to centrocytes which form the light zone. The centrocytes are then presented with immune complexes with follicular dendritic cells and helper T cells. Then they receive the pro-survival signals, they exit the germinal center and form long-lived plasma cells and post-germinal center memory B cells. And then we also talk briefly talked about the molecular. And just uh, before I forget, so the genes that we talked about included BCL2, remember that the centroblast lack BCL2. We talked about BCL6 right now. We talked about MYC. We talked about BLIMP1. We also talked about PAX5. And these genes are implicated in multiple lymphomas and leukemias and we hear about them pretty commonly. So, uh, so just uh, at the end, I would say that the source of my information here has been mostly the WHO here uh, classification of the hematopoietic neoplasms, both fourth edition and the fifth edition, which is currently in the beta, beta version online. Um, and I hope you like the video and I hope that I can come up with newer topics and please let me know if you have any recommendations or any changes that I need to make. And thank you so much for listening.